Thank you all so much for being here. We're just thrilled to have you. I'm Jenna Johnson-Hanks. I'm the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science. On behalf of the college, I really want to warmly welcome you and thank you for attending, uh, for attending tonight. The specific topic of tonight's uh, conversation is decision-making. And sometimes it feels like decision-making is basically all we do. It's all of life. There are little decisions and big ones, and there are ones that we think hard about and wonder this or that and ponder, and there are decisions that we make as if by rote, <laughs> uh, ones that we make collectively, whether more by consensus or by vote. So we're going to talk today about a whole range of, of kinds of decisions, and we're going to think about them across a very wide range of disciplinary perspectives. Um, again, one of the great strengths of the college is this great breadth. There are many different kinds of distinctions we could make, but I want you to especially listen and think about the distinction between think how we study decision-making as, as an empirical object, where we observe how different people or different groups might make decisions in different empirical contexts, and the other perspective being how we should make decisions, a normative one. What is an, on, what is an honorable decision or a just one or an empirically founded one? Um, and you're going to hear both of those uh, individually and then in, in uh, conversation today. So I'm going to introduce the panel, um, and then they're each going to speak briefly uh, from their own perspective, and then we're going to have time for conversation back and forth, including bringing you into the conversation. Uh, so our first speaker tonight is, is Linda Wilbrecht, a professor of uh, psychology and neuroscience, our brand new department of neuroscience. Uh, Dr. Wilbrecht works on adolescent brain development, which I rely upon very often when I'm trying to understand our students. <laughs> um, her research interests are, are wide ranging, including experience based plasticity and the development of the circuits necessary for learning and decision making. Um, her degrees are from the University of Minnesota, University of Oxford, and Rockefeller University. Marika Lando Wells is, is Assistant Professor of Political Science. She holds a degree from Harvard and from London School of Economics and from, and from MIT. Her research uh, is concerned with how cognitive processes affect political decision making, political preferences and political behavior, um, and, and how <laughs> Some, someone say, <laughs> yes, we're looking forward to this conversation. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the sort of the neurological, the, neur, the neural and psychological underpinning, um, particularly the under, particularly the neural reactions to threat and danger and how those influence people's preferences around policy. Wes Holliday is professor of philosophy and chair of the group of logic and methodology of science, a um, degree from that other school down the street. Um, <laughs> and I know you have some allies here, right? He specializes in logic and social choice theory and is published in a wide range of journals on logic, philosophy, mathematics, economics, political science. Um, when you are a philosopher, your work is relevant to a very wide range of, of disciplinary approaches. Um, he's also the co-creator of the Stable Voting website and Preferential Voting Tools Library. Again, we're going to look forward to that conversation. And our last speaker tonight is, Par is Saul Perlmutter, the Franklin and Karen Weber Dabby Professor of Physics and the 2011 Nobel Laureate, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, he's a leader in International Supernova Cosmology Project and the executive director and executive director, faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics. He's also astonishing work, and he's here today because he is also very well known for the work he's done over the past decade in bringing together faculty and students from across a very wide range of, of disciplines um, to, to, work, uh, to work on the project of sense and sensibility in science. Like, how do we use tools and approaches from across the entirety of the College of Letters and Science uh, to make uh, better decisions and to, to teach students how to do that. Uh, he holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard and a PhD from Berkeley. So with that, I will hand the floor to Linda. Right. Thank you so much, Jenna, and hello, everyone. 
Thank you for being here. I, I am, as Jenna said, an adolescent uh, scientist. I'm interested in adolescence, which we define as from age 10 to 25. I don't have my 10-year-old here, so she, you know, I, there's, there, all my theory will be tested by my own children. <laughs> And I, I work in animals and in people. We study uh, mice in the laboratory, and we also study uh, eight to 18 year olds from the, the local community. And uh, a little less than 10 years ago, I set out on a project with my colleagues, um, Ann Collins in psychology and Ron Dahl in public health, um, to try to understand how adolescent learning and decision making changes from eight to 18. And we have some very controlled laboratory tasks and some very beautiful computational models and we thought it would be fairly simple to understand when adolescents are making decisions and they're learning from recent feedback, playing little games um, a, on a laptop, how are they integrating positive information and negative information? And we thought that we would be able to chart maybe a, a, a increasing um, sensitivity to positive information, maybe a some sensation-seeking peaks in mid-adolescence, which is a well-described phenomenon. Um, we thought we might see um, changes in, in integration of negative information, maybe more and more of that negative information informing the decision making as, as you got older. And um, the reason we do experiments is what we believe from our armchair, of course, isn't always you know, correct. And you know, this, this idea that we're going to study adolescent decision making and find something simple, um, you know, maybe <laughs> with, in, in hindsight. Um, uh, we, we, were, we were set up to be surprised. And um, you know, what, what we found was that, that there was no good answer to this in our laboratory experiment. The adolescents were integrating negative and positive um, information to make their decisions. Um, both, um, and, and some very stark differences, um, but it changed not only with age, but with the task that we were giving them. The same person doing three tasks on the same day integrated the information very differently depending upon the task that they were performing. Uh, and what we realized is, is that context and the state that someone is in may be just as important as the age that they are. And um, we really, um, have to systematically, we have to go back to the drawing board and systematically think about context and understanding, but I think what would be relevant to tonight's panel is that uncertainty became really important, the state of uncertainty around the task, whether we were giving rewards 100% of the time for a correct answer or 70% of the time for a correct answer was really important. And there was a second surprise with these adolescent um, experiments the um, amount of uncertainty, when there was high level of uncertainty, the adolescents actually outperformed adults and outperformed children. And we think that uh, there might be a really good explanation for this because we also work in animal models and we think about wild animals and their natural environment. And there's this narrative I won't repeat as to not reinforce it. If, if I, I meet anyone on a plane or a train, I tell them I work in adolescence. They start telling me all about adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we won't mention what they say. Uh, but when you think about wild animals leaving the nest, our, our falcons leaving the Campanile, they have to have a lot of important you know, they have a lot of important decisions to make, right? And they have a lot of important learning to do. And so this, the brain in adolescence might be supercharged for learning, especially in uncertain environments. And when you go back and, you know, we go back and take a, took a look at the literature, we weren't the only ones finding adolescents were, were showing a prowess in some tasks um, uh, relative to adults and children, but there were other experiments. And one interesting commonality across other experiments from other laboratories was that uncertainty and volatility in the environment um, were, were the context where we saw adolescents really shine. And so I think it's interesting to think that, you know, in these times of uncertainty and volatility, we, you know, we might, we might be looking to our adolescents um, and asking them for good solutions. Um, and I'll just touch on one, one other thing before I hand the mic over is this, this question of how do we make better decisions? and thinking about framing or priming or context. And there's some really new research that, that's not coming from my laboratory, but I'll just, I'll just highlight it because it's so gorgeous, um, coming from the University of Washington in Seattle, um, a laboratory of Larry Zweifel just posted on our archive this research that shows that um, a, a rodent making a decision um, in the context where they get a cue of safety, they have release of dopamine into part of the amygdala, part of the brain important for threat learning, but also for cues related to addiction. But if they have the dopamine release in the amygdala, they learn about threats in a very specific way. So the, the learning is very constrained to that specific element, and they're open to positive experiences and, and, and other conditions. But if they 
don't have dopamine in the amygdala at that time, which can come from positive safety signals, um, then they learn about threat in a more generalized way. Um, they, the threat smears and spreads to many more contexts. Uh, and so I, I, I really like this mechanistic understanding, um, this mechanistic description. I think this can help us um, design better experiments, design better contexts that would help facilitate learning. Uh, it could help clinical contexts too, where people are trying to recover from trauma. Uh, it could also help in understanding what happens in elections and, and um, what kind of uh, integration of positive and negative outcomes will, will result you know, when someone's just heard a political speech that, that you know, maybe starts with a lot of, or ends with a lot of optimism or ends with uh, mentions of, of bad outcomes. All right, and with that, I will hand it over. Um, well, thank you all for being here, and thank you uh, to Jenna and everyone at LNS for the, the invitation to, to come um, be on this panel tonight. It's very cool. Um, so I studied decision making mostly in the context of national security. Um, what drew me to those kind of problems are really the stakes. So the decisions I study are, you know, war and peace, life and death, um, billions that are spent on particular defensive technologies, whether to do that, whether to not do that. Um, and I'm writing a book on that at the moment. And the way that I think about it is that I start actually, um, your lead in was perfect, Linda. Um, I start from the, the idea that threat perception um, has a pretty big effect on national security decision making. Uh, and in the book, which is sort of in two parts, I first look at how threat perception works in the brain based on not just my work, but everything that we know from largely from neuroscience and behavioral biology, uh, and then sort of carry that forward into an understanding of the decision making processes that go on when people are confronted with big, scary new threats, um, and not just to themselves, but to the countries they happen to be, to some extent, responsible for. And so in the second part of the book, I look at a few uh, cases. One of them is looking at the responses to communism uh, in the early Cold War, so just after World War II, then looking at the responses to terrorism uh, in the George W. Bush administration right after 9-11, looking at um, the sort of more slow moving threat of climate change and how people uh, and leaders of states have chosen to respond to that. Uh, and also sort of briefly at COVID. Um, and across all of these different cases at different times involving different people, um, there are some pretty consistent themes. And one of them is that although we can armchair quarterback the kind of decision making that went on, so which national security strategies were gonna keep the nation safe, whether or not invading another country is a good idea, we can sit back and, and judge those, those decisions. At the time, they were not particularly obvious or, or clear in terms of choices. And there was a lot of debate, not just about whether or not to make a particular choice, but in fact, about the nature of the danger in the first place. And so one of the, the sort of theoretical points that I make in the book, but also sort of prove out with um, a sort of brain level perspective, is that danger isn't just one thing. Your brain doesn't just sort of go off and say danger. There are different kinds of harms to us in our environments, which are quite varied. And our brains can sense different, different types of problems, and we're good at avoiding different types of problems. And what I find is that depending on the kind of problem they thought they faced, Policymakers wanted to make different types of decisions in terms of safety choices, in terms of investments to make in the name of national security. So to give you an example, in the context of the, the early Cold War, people weren't really sure what kind of problem communism was. This was actually up for a lot of debate. Some people looked at it as an ideology, and it had certain principles, and those principles were antithetical to certain democratic rights and freedoms, and they thought, okay, well, we need to combat communism, so we need to protect our rights and freedoms. There were other folks who weren't super concerned about that, but they said, look, communism is backed by a country that's going to have nuclear weapons pretty soon, and lots of them. And actually, the main problem we face here is that they're going to come over and carpet bomb us out of existence. Now, the solutions that you pick, if you think that the, the main threat that you face is being carpet bombed out of existence versus a threat to your rights and freedoms, you're gonna adopt very different, very different strategies to handle those two things. And you add in the mix a third kind of harm that humans are really good at avoiding, and that's contamination. You have people, probably best epitomized by J. Edgar Hoover, weren't that worried about rights and freedoms, weren't that worried about 
wasn't that worried actually about the existential problem of getting carpet bombed. He was worried about a virus in the bloodstream of Lady Liberty, as he put it. And he was worried about communism as a domestic threat. And again, those folks who saw things the way that he did proposed totally different national security strategies in many ways. And so when we look back on the decisions that people made and the policies that were ultimately in place, it helps to consider that there was actually a pretty serious contest of, of ideas about what choices needed to be made because they didn't agree on what problem they were trying to solve. And I see this re repeat. Um, we can see it today with climate change, a few years ago with COVID. Same holds for, for dealing with terrorism. And the approach that I take, which is to really sort of focus on how the brain processes danger, um, I do because the alternative, which is sort of, I don't know, uh, popular in my field, um, is to take a more sort of rational choice approach that decisions should be made based on costs and benefits. Uh, and I can say this as somebody who, before academia, worked for a while in corporate finance. Like even financial decisions aren't based only on costs and benefits. Um, a lot of other things come into play, especially when the stakes are high. So to think that decisions of life and death and war and peace are made based on a simple calculus, I think is um, not very helpful and not gonna explain very many decisions. And so I happen to take my approach kind of down to the brain. And the motivation for all of this, for me anyway, is that, as I said, it's really easy to kind of armchair quarterback and say, you know, such and such a decision was a mistake. But if you think, and this is another theme in the book, if you sort of acknowledge that the decisions that people make to make themselves and everyone around them safer have the sometimes intended, sometimes unintended consequence of making a lot of other people less safe. Right? This is a problem of security choices. The choices that we make uh, for our benefit are not necessarily for the benefits of everyone. If you think that that's kind of problematic, um, and you think that maybe there's a way to kind of step back and reconsider some of those decisions, especially when they're not very likely to pan out, um, I think you have to sort of appreciate the cognitive processes that are involved. So with my undergrads, I always use the example of missile defense. Um, ballistic missile defense has been a dream for a long time. It's a psychological palliative. It solves a certain kind of problem, but it doesn't work. And physics, physicists have told us it's not gonna work. Uh, particularly well for a very long time, but it doesn't stop us from wanting it, from spending money on it. So you could say like, that's probably a bad decision, not a great decision, but it still happens. And we might wanna figure out how to get people sort of moving away from it. But I don't think you can do that just by saying, this is about the numbers. Um, you have to figure out why people want it, why it, it always sells. Um, and security does sell, uh, safety does sell and not always to our benefit. So that's why I kind of focused on it. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks everybody for being here and for LNS for putting this on. So I'm coming from philosophy and logic. So I have kind of more abstract uh, take uh, on this topic, although I really appreciate the empirical um, side as well. So I wanna start this off with something very exciting, which is a quote from a logic textbook from 1662. <laughs> uh, that would. So this is translated from French. This is a, something called the Port Royal Logic. It's about decision making. Great quote. To judge what one ought to do, to obtain a good or avo avoid an evil, one must not only consider the good and the evil in itself, but also the probability that it will or will not happen, and view geometrically the proportion that all these things have together. That's quite modern. <laughs> So indeed, that's 1662, that now is kind of the classical theory in philosophy and in economics of rational decision making. That now gets formalized mathematically in the theory of what's called expected utility maximization. But it's just the idea that a rational decision maker can be modeled as if they choose between actions as follows. They write down all the possible consequences that could result from their action and they consider not only how good or bad that action is, could try to quantify that with a number called the utility of that consequence, but also weight that by the probability of that consequence obtaining conditional on my action. So if we're making a big decision, like something I've been thinking about these, these days is AI and AI safety versus AI acceleration. 
you know, should we put the pedal to the metal on, on AI or should we pause and take our time and, and invest in safety? You know, I want to consider the possible outcomes. I'm, I'm very uncertain, right? Will, will AI progress kind of asymptote? Will it, you know, will we have an intelligence explosion? If we invest too much in capabilities, will we trigger human extinction? And in each of these cases, I want to consider not just how likely it is, but also how good or bad it would be. So you may think that the human extinction possibility is very low probability, but maybe it's of great consequence. Maybe the utility is really, really low if we have human extinction. So this idea of weighting the possible consequences by the probability and also the utility is, is this cornerstone of this expected utility idea. So that's just about individual decision making. And there's a lot to say about that. Both descriptively, we know from like behavioral economics that people cannot be modeled as perfect expected utility maximizers. And there's, there's also, maybe that's not a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> there's also a normative question about whether the rational agent ought to behave like that. And there's even debate in philosophy about whether that's the right model for what people ought to do. But what I'm actually interested in most is group decision making where things get even more complicated because of course the different agents have conflicting preferences. We don't just have a single utility function. My utility function might disagree with yours. Now one straightforward idea to group decision making is we should just take the action on behalf of the group that maximizes the sum of all our utilities for whatever consequences would, would come about. And the difficulty with that is there's a couple of problems. One is it's very hard to elicit from people these numerical values that I could then add up in this kind of calculus that we already heard about. Um, not only is it difficult to elicit these numbers, but some people have even argued that it's impossible to put your utility values on the same scale as my utility values in such a way that it makes sense to add and subtract them. And there's ethical concerns about whether even if we could somehow get that information from everybody, whether it would be right to just add and, and, and subtract our utilities. So there's a different approach to decision making, which I think we're all familiar with, and in some ways requires less information um, from individuals, and that's voting. Okay? So less information in the sense that you know, when you collect ballots from people, you're not collecting their full numerical utilities on all kinds of outcomes. Um, now, voting, of course, can happen after a period of deliberation and debate. So it's not like we, we just want to go straight to the voting. We want some prior process. Um, but what I'm especially interested in is what are the right methods of voting or better methods of voting, especially in the democratic context. So as we all know, the very familiar type of voting that we have like in the United States in many places is what's called plurality voting, where each individual just gets to indicate one option that they want to vote for and the option with the most votes wins. So we're all familiar with this from political elections. And um, voting theorists generally think this is not a great way of doing voting, actually. Um, it's very convenient and simple, uh, but there are big costs. So especially problems with this kind of plurality voting are vote splitting and spoiler effects, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, remember the 2000 election in Florida? That's a famous case, a very consequential case where arguably there was a spoiler effect. So what happened there is, you know, when voters were only allowed to vote for one candidate, so the major candidates there were Gore, uh, Bush, and Nader, and as you know, the, the vote between um, Gore and Bush was extremely close. The number of people who voted for Nader in that election, and of course Nader had no chance really of, of winning Florida, the number of people who um, voted for Nader was much larger than the margin between um, Gore and Bush. And it's plausible that many of those Gore voters, um, sorry, many, many of those Nader voters would have preferred Gore to Bush. But of course, they couldn't indicate that on their ballot. They could only indicate who was their, their favorite person. So it's plausible that actually a majority of people um, would have preferred uh, Gore rather than Bush, and a majority of people would have prefer preferred Gore rather than Nader, and yet we had no way of letting people express that on their ballot. Okay. So this is not at all to make a partisan comment about you know, how that election would have should have gone, it's just that structurally the election system did not allow the voters to really express their, their will. Um, so how can we do better? Well, one reform that you may be familiar with is the use of ranked ballots where you collect more information from voters. So not all the way to collecting numerical utilities from the voters which you then add up, that would be one extreme of the spectrum of how much information to collect. But a more intermediate point is allow voters to at least express a ranking of the candidates. Okay, you don't have to rank all of the candidates, but at least 
give some more information than just who is my favorite. And if we had allowed that in, uh, in Florida, then a lot of people who, who voted for Nader could have said, Nader's my first choice, um, followed by Gore, followed by Bush. And then if you have a reasonable way of tallying up these ranked ballots, once it's clear that Gore, uh, sorry, once it's clear that Nader is not the winner, you can see that a lot of people who um, voted for Nader first preferred Gore to Bush, okay? So that's the kind of reform that I think we should roll out, actually in political elections, is the use of ranked ballots. There's now also a, a sort of more subtle question of what method should you use to compute the winner on the basis of the ranked ballots? And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A if people are interested, but the basic idea comes from a French uh, philosopher and mathematician named Condorcet in the 1700s. And he had an idea which is very simple, which is look at how each pair of candidates does against the other. So ask yourself, to, in the Florida case, do more people prefer Gore to Bush or Bush to Gore? And let's suppose if we had collected ranked ballots, more people would have ranked uh, Gore over Bush than vice versa. Then we say Gore beats Bush head to head. And then we would have asked the same question about Gore versus Nader, and maybe we would have found that more people rank Gore over Nader than vice versa, and then Gore would have won that head-to-head -head match. And if there's a candidate who beats every other one, which, which we call the Condorcet winner now, that's the candidate who should be elected. So this is a kind of normative claim about, not about how we do make political decisions now, but how I think we ought to, and I think there's reason to believe that this would really actually help with problems like polarization, help with problems like now um, third party candidates are deterred from joining elections because they're worried about spoiling the election. This would mitigate the spoiler effect and therefore include more voices in the political process. That's my little pitch. <laughs> so I'll, I'll finish up with uh, another angle on this uh, the same topic, although I must say that each of the different topics that we discussed before show up in, uh, in what I'll be describing, I, I think. Um, the, so this is an educational uh, approach. To what would it be that you'd like to teach at a university that would be possibly helpful in when people are going to be making decisions in, in the world, either individually or in groups or as a society, as, as we're describing? And um, I personally came to this not from cosmology. So there were very few decisions with cosmology that actually <laughs> brought, brought me to this one. But about a dozen years ago, I remember watching our society making what seemed to be just practical decisions like, you know, what's the right level for the debt ceiling of our, of our country? Um, this doesn't sound like a religious issue. It sounds like just a practical thing of, you know, what turns out to be the best way to do this. Um, and yet, that's not how the, the discussions that you saw around you were being, were being played. And I was noticing at that time, I would go to the lunchroom at the, at the uh, the, the cafeteria up at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory where you know, many of the scientists um, have their research groups from, from the university. And you would, people would be talking about all sorts of modern day problems over lunch. And I realized that the kinds of discussions you were hearing over the lunch table there just didn't look anything like the kinds of discussions that you would be hearing out in the world around us, um, or certainly not in the political debates. And they, they were using just a it seemed like a different vocabulary of, of, uh, of problem solving and decision making um, than, than you, you would see when people were, were looking you know, elsewhere in the, in the world. And I was trying to think, well, where is it that those, that vocabulary um, was being taught? And it was not taught in any science course I knew of. And you know, these are all scientists that you know, no math, physics, biology, chemistry course um, was, was teaching th these concepts. It was mostly being taught by essentially an apprenticeship as, as uh, these researchers went through you know, their research PhDs and, and, uh, and into postdocs and even as young uh, faculty. And I was trying to think, that, that, is it possible that we could just extract and, and uh, articulate what these ideas were? And it would be interesting to see, could you teach them much younger and, and teach them intentionally, not just through osmosis. And so I started a, uh, I, and, I, and I realized that it wasn't good enough for me to do this just as a physicist, because many of these, uh, of the things that you need to, in these decision making really come from you know, the, our, my, our colleagues across the campus, you know, who, who have many other areas of expertise. So I, uh, I found a professor of social psychology, uh, um, Rob McCoon, who was at that time in the public policy school, and the law school actually, and I found a philosophy professor, John Campbell, and, uh, and, I, and they got interested in this idea, and we put a, we put a sign up uh, saying, are you, are you embarrassed watching our society make decisions? Come help, 
come help invent a chorus, come help save the world. And, and about 30 uh, uh, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates started showing up um, on the end of every Friday. We'd meet around, I think, four o'clock in the afternoons on Fridays. And uh, we would ask what would be a minimal set of ideas that would be useful for everybody to, to know in order to be able to just think through problems together better. And uh, we ended up, uh, over a course of nine months, we go, we go on you know, past dinner time you know, on, the, on these Fridays. Um, eventually, we came up with some, I think it was like 23 concepts that we thought would be kind of interesting to see, could you teach? And then we started asking, are there ways to teach these that might catch on and that people would recognize when they saw it, not only in their own lives, but they would recognize it when they read it, uh, something going on in the, in the newspaper, um, and, uh, and for that matter, in, in politics. And they would, and the combinations of ideas, some of them were just the ways that scientists over the years have noticed that we tend to fool ourselves and the ways that we tend to go wrong. And so there are lots of tricks of the trade that people have developed to try to avoid fooling ourselves in those particular ways again. These include you know, the, uh, the fact that we learn that it's very easy for us to see random noise, just uh, coincidences, and think we see a pattern and we understand how the world works. And as scientists, um, over the years, people realized that they were constantly getting fooled by these things. They had to uh, get more aware of how often random numbers look like real effects. And, uh, and so that was something we, we, you could actually teach. And it meant this is sort of the underpinnings of why we go to, to statistics and why, and why we need statistics, um, because we aren't very good at recognizing these things w you know, without these other tools. Some of the concepts are concepts that having to do with just probabilistic thinking in general, the fact that we tend to like to uh, you know, have our debates as if everything is absolutely true or absolutely not true. Um, whereas, in fact, very few things, may, very few propositions in the world do we know enough to know that they are absolutely true. At best, maybe they're 99.9999% likely to be true, and we bet our lives on it. We'll, we'll get on that airplane and assume those tons of metal are going to fly. Um, but, but most things are not that sure. You, know, you have maybe 85% um, con conviction that maybe uh, teachers are teaching to the test nowadays and therefore standardized testing is a bad idea. But you wouldn't be shocked, you know, maybe 15% odds that that was not really going on. Um, and it's good to be able to differentiate those different levels of certainty. And uh, it, it makes you, I think, a more nimble uh, you know, thinker if you, can, if you can play with the probabilities, which I was, I was thinking of in terms of the adolescence, um, that in some sense, the scientists are being trained as best they can to stay as, ad as adolescent as they can for as long as possible. Um, and, 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 and to be uh, you know, able to hold things in that, that sense of, you know, we're not really sure, but therefore we really need to know what the odds are you know, in, 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 these, in these different respects. Um, so a lot of the course uh, topics then had to do with these forms of skepticism, ways that we fool ourselves. But there is, in, in some sense, that's the breaks of science to avoid you know, falling into error, falling into traps. But there, you can't drive a car with just brakes. And another whole aspect of the culture of science is sort of the, the accelerator pedal, um, which has to do with being able to take on big problems. And uh, you know, there are a number of different elements that we realize we could teach that have to do with that. One is just the fact that most of us do have very little idea of, of how long it takes to solve an interesting problem. And we tend to give up way too early. On, on any problem that's really worth its salt. Um, you ask, you know, we ask the students, you know, what's the second longest you ever spent uh, trying to solve a problem or a puzzle? And of course, uh, we say second longest because you don't want the one time somebody got obsessed, you know. And, the, <laughs> and, and we find that, you know, people say, well, you know, I've, I've spent hours on it one time, you know, or I spent maybe days. But, you know, of course, the kinds of problems that most scientists and, and researchers work on, you know, these are interesting problems and, and they tend to take months, if you're lucky, years, typically, decades, sometimes. And, and that's not terrible. I mean, that actually is, it, it, it's the kind of, um, you need a culture of conviction that you can solve problems so that you can you know, convince yourself you can solve a problem long enough to actually stick with it to solve it. So, so that's an element. And then there are these other elements of you know, how you parse a problem um, that seems way too complex. There's no way we're going to be able to solve a, you know, these vast problems of I don't know, global warming or uh, you know, pandemics, whatever it would be. But if you parse it into and figure out where are the main levers that are driving things and which things are you paying a lot of attention to, but they're not really that important, it makes a huge difference. And so we taught some of those techniques for that, some techniques for 
the uh, you know, fast estimation that's necessary in a modern world to tell when you're being fooled by numbers. Um, so a number of things that make you feel a little more powerful as a, a solver of problems, and they can be the accelerator pedal um, to go along with all the skepticism which is the brakes. And then finally, we uh, turn to a whole other aspect of this problem, which is that even if you've taught all these techniques of rationality um, in problem solving, it makes no difference when you get to the group decision making. Um, if if you don't think through, um, how are you going to actually weave all that rationality in to what's driving a decision for a group, which is all the fears and the goals and the ambitions and the, and the values um, that, that are in play. And you, if, if you say, well, that's not my problem, we're just teaching how to, you know, the rationality, um, you're, not really, you're not really doing anybody any service because um, you know, what, since those aren't the things that got you into the room, um, it's the, the rationality is the part that will get left behind if you don't manage to come up with some way to weave them in in a, in a consistent way. So then we spend actually the last whole fraction of the course um, looking at different techniques that people have developed for weaving together the values and, and the goals and the fears with the rationality so that you don't lose any of those things. And ideally to be able to adjudicate in different ways and have people recognize which parts of this are really factual parts that you would have to have a certain kind of argumentation over versus which parts of these are really values and priorities um, that you have to have a different kind of uh, argument ab about. And so that becomes a, a big a part of the course at, at the end as well. Um, so we've now been teaching this with all th uh, always having three faculty in the room from natural science, social science, and humanities um, at all times uh, to, to model you know, what it looks like to have different people deliberate together in, in, a, in a thoughtful way. Um, and the students are from all those areas as well and all uh, classes in our, in our uh, university. And we found that the students really seem to, to get it. I mean, they, they seem to, to pick this up. We do lots of experiential game playing and activities and, and discussion that gets them to recognize it in the, in the world around them, their personal world and, and, the, and the larger world. Um, and we hear from the students that they feel like it's been a really important part of their education. In fact, somebody just uh, stopped me on, this, on, on, the, uh, on a walk uh, yesterday, uh, no, actually two days ago, um, and said they just want to tell me that um, they took this course as a freshman and it's shaped everything they've done <laughs> in the years afterwards, which is very nice to hear. You know, when you, you're gonna, and of course, it's a somewhat self-selected group that comes to take a course like this, so I don't know, you know whether that we will uh, see this um, you know, in a larger and larger scale, but we're trying now to spread this to a, to a bigger and bigger part of the, this university and to other universities. And so uh, now uh, Harvard is teaching a, a variant of the course. Um, Irvine, the University of Chicago just picked it up this last spring. And we're also working with the Nobel Prize Foundation to develop a high school version of the course um, that can be, because uh, you know, every place in the world picks up their teaching material without going through their school boards first. <laughs> and so we're hoping that there may be a possibility that you know, if you wait 20 years from now, will be just that little smidgen better at being able to think through problems together and, and, uh, and, and, I, and I, obviously that's the, that's the goal. But all of this, of course, is subject to all the revisions of everything that we learn along the way and we're constantly coming back to the class and saying, you know, it's something we were teaching you recently, we think that may be wrong. And that, and that in fact, you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't feel disturbed by this, but that um, the, the way that we, that's part of this progress, that we're constantly discovering new ways that we're, that we're getting things wrong, we're fooling ourselves, and we'll constantly do better and better at, at, at uh, you know, holding those at bay. So that's the, uh, that, that was the content. I, we, I will mention that uh, I think the reason some of those, uh, those pages are on your, your chairs is because um, we also, the three faculty end up writing a book that just came out this, this uh, spring. And, uh, and so uh, if, you're, if you're curious, you can find, you can find the, the, uh, the, the book listed there. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> So, so we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Does, do people have questions? Oh, all right. I was expecting that I would need to fill a little space, but I'm not going to. Please, speak up. And if you could just introduce yourself and then ask your question. Right now, uh, I, uh, student Ron Howard, that's a millionaire, name, uh, at Stanford. Oh, um, but, but I also taught at Berkeley briefly. So, so. Uh, but my two favorite books on this topic right now are Thinking Fast and Think Thinking Slow and The Power of Us. What do you think of those books and what would you add to that list of reading that I should get out and do? 
Well, I'll just start with a quick mention of the fact that uh, thinking fast and slow um, is a, is a was a whole section of what we were of what we ended up teaching because we realized that you know it's the uh, you know, along with all these other ways that we can go wrong, there are all the ways that our cognitive processes um, fall into certain, you know, very standard uh, known traps and that it was at least worth sensitizing people to that. But let me pass it to the others who are more expert in these topics. I, I have a book recommendation that just came out a few weeks ago. It's, it's called From 10 to 25 by David Yeager. And it's, it's about um, adolescent thinking and it's geared toward teachers, but also people in the business world and, and um, working with the next generation with a more um, supportive mentoring attitude rather than an adolescent incompetence model. <laughs> Marika, any other books you want to recommend? I mean, all the books I read are just about such depressing things. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, those will give you a positive take on, on humanity, so that's probably pretty good. Uh, but if you, if you want... Um, if you want something else, uh, Richard Rangham, uh, his most recent book is something I assigned to my students um, who do sort of in my psychology and conflict class um, as a way of thinking about the long sort of evolutionary trajectory of, of why it is that people think fighting is a good idea uh, and particularly whom they fight with and why. Yeah, maybe just one on the more technical side, but if you want to see how economists and, and philosophers think about the normative theory of decision making, there's an economist named Gil Boa who has a number of books on this topic, including a, a more accessible one. Um, I'm just forgetting the name of it, but look at Gil Boa on Amazon. Hi, my name is uh, Sean, and um, I am the parent of a budding neuroscientist. <laughs> um, I have a question about adolescent thinking. So one of the things I took away from what you said during your comments were that adolescent brains can thrive in uncertainty, sometimes better than adults or other, other areas. What happens when parents in particular or the society does all they can to remove uncertainty from adolescents' lives? There's, there's um, I, th I think the, a good model for thinking about the adolescent brain is that you need experience um, in order to set the wiring. There, there is a lot of plasticity and there's a lot of new connections that are reaching out and trying out different things. And that's probably experience, um, experience expectant plasticity is, is a term we use to think about that, that it's happening in advance of the information coming in, that you have these synapses reaching out and you probably need those experiences in order to confirm the synapses. And I think our, our, our general model as a parent is just um, safety focused and that you're gonna wait through this period. Um, and, it, it, um, and, and it's especially if you think about incarceration of juveniles without, you know, and, and just lack of opportunities and uh, for internships or, or uh, the pandemic and being at home. We, you know, really, that, that plasticity is there and it needs to be fed by information and experience um, in negative. It's, I think it's really hard as a parent to allow some negative consequences to happen um, but, but, and to allow learning from those negative consequences. And so, yeah, how do we, I, uh, a good model, I think, is to scaffold development um, and take that scaffold away, scaffolding away slowly to make sure you survived 18, uh, but, but also to ensure that, that there is um, some um, sense of trying something and finding out what happens. I feel like uh, critical thinking is not always front and center anymore. That doesn't happen as often. And with the advent of AI, I think a lot of first level critical thinking is being, that opportunity for people to practice is being taken away. So do you have any thoughts about that and what, will that change things? What was your name? Oh. <laughs> My name's Britt. <laughs> yes, you wanna take yeah, that I one? I can take that coming from philosophy because of course we're super concerned about this. I mean, that's one of our main goals is to help students learn how to be analytical thinkers. So we don't want them to just outsource their thinking to the chatbot. Um, so, I mean, we've been having a lot of internal discussions about um, you know, how to make sure that doesn't happen. Because I think it's really important that um, humans don't lose control of the whole decision-making process and just say, well, we'll let, the, let the machine make the decision. It's kind of inscrutable to us how exactly it, it arrived at that decision. 
that would be a kind of loss of control for humanity that I think it's really important to avoid. So I don't know that we have all the solutions yet, <laughs> but it's something that at least the philosophy faculty has definitely been thinking a lot, a lot about. I was going to mention that in the in trying to teach a course that's basically a critical thinking course, um, we, we were thinking that, well, one approach might be um, to have the students be not only gauging where the other uh, humans are going wrong, but also um, gauging where the, the uh, you know, chat GPT is going wrong. And that, um, so that that's the style of teaching that I think some people have been talking about where you actually ask them to, you know, along with everything else, go and actually, you know, ask the answer from the chat GPT and then you figure out whether or not it's making all the same mistakes that the humans that it's trained on, you know, might have made, um, or is it making different mistakes? And, uh, and so maybe that might be our, 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 an approach to pedagogically dealing with some of this. Um, and then hopefully people will do that in real life. Hi, yeah, my hand went up really early. I'm an I'm a alumni, um, a Russian major, retired infectious disease physician. So my question to all of you is, what about the illusion of rationality and decision-making? I didn't quite hear that in everybody's comments. Can you ask that question? Can, can you reframe that in a, rephrase that just one more time to make sure that we understand clearly what the question is? Sure. Um, there's a lot of reasons to make decisions. One of them is, oh, the world is round. Well, I could sail my boat around it. Um, well, maybe the world isn't round. You know, looking at how we believe the world to be versus how it really is, and then what are we going to do regarding what it is? I won't get into politics, I promise. But as a Russian major, I went to behind the Soviet Union in, you know, in the Iron Curtain a long time ago. And it was very interesting. And it wasn't perfect. And I came back a much more patriotic American. But it was really interesting to see how we can look at the other side. So not only from a standpoint of what we think is right, Democrat, blah, 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 blah but also how are we deciding? Um, I had care many care patients die of AIDS. And some of them just, you know, I just can't put up with this. You know, I'm just going to give my life. So kind of have a conversation about the do versus the talk or the rationale versus got to live my life. Did that help? <laughs> Wes, you, yeah, have, okay, Wes thinks ahead. he's got it. No, no, go <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make one distinction because philosophers love to make distinctions which is um, between rationality as a kind of internal coherence and, and a different notion of accuracy. So your beliefs could be, like my belief about how likely it is to rain later this week could be more or less accurate. So that's one question. But maybe they're very inaccurate, actually. But the models of actually rational decision-making that come like from economics and, and philosophy, a person could be rational in the sense of being totally coherent in how they make decisions, even though their probabilistic estimates are very inaccurate. Okay, they're like bad meteorologists. They're bad at predicting the weather, <laughs> right? So I think what I was trying to pull out of your question was a concern about accuracy, about whether the world is, is round or flat. And I think that's, in a, in a way, a separable question from the internal logic and coherence of the decision-making. Marika, I think you... Yeah, I mean, I think that part of the problem is that for, for some of the things that we care about deeply and decisions that we'd like to be able to make, the, the problem that West pinpoints is, is even harder because it's, accuracy is just not possible, um, especially when it comes to sort of reasoning about, for example, other people. So one of the things that, you know, humans are good at, we have to reason about each other, but we don't, we don't actually have to be right very often. We can actually be wrong in really useful ways. So if I infer that everyone's intentions are slightly better than they are, I'll be more cooperative. It's probably a good thing. I'm wrong, but like, it's not bad. <laughs> um, but it, it's just to say that we have to construct the world and everyone in it that we need to interact with. And we're going to be wrong a lot of the time. When we are wrong in a way that affects a decision that we're going to make, and if that decision seems very consequential, we might think that 
to the extent we believe there's information out there that we can go get to reduce the uncertainty that we have, um, we should find ways to encourage that kind of information seeking. Um, in government decision making, you know, you can, you can get better intelligence to a point, um, but only to a point. And there is going to be uncertainty around a lot of the decisions that are still made. And it means that, you know, you, you have to be in some sense disciplined about the reality you construct for yourself. So people are generally also not great at reasoning too far away from themselves. Um, and one of the uh, study that I'm about to publish, I asked people to think about threats that they understand. So climate change is one and illegal immigration is another. And then I ask another half of people to say, why do you think that people who are worried about those things are worried? And so the sample is split. They're answering at exactly the same time. Some people are answering for themselves, and some people are answering for those others. And I measure the accuracy of those guesses. So how good are people at thinking about the threats that others perceive? And the trick is you have to share a belief that that thing is dangerous. If you don't believe that climate change is dangerous, you're going to have a very hard time accurately imagining why someone else does. Same with illegal immigration. If you're not, if you don't share that underlying belief, you're not very good at that imaginary jump. And that's a really simple jump. It's a jump in a survey. It's a jump when the stakes are low. It's a jump when someone's not your enemy. Um, if you add in all those layers, it makes it much harder to understand accurately the world from someone else's perspective. So I regard that as a challenge more than a problem. I think it's just a fundamental thing we have to grapple with. Oh, I, I just, okay. one thing to add to that too is that it, sometimes you can find an individual who has the information, yet it doesn't, it doesn't inform their behavior. I mean, you, you, someone with frontal temporal dementia, might know they're hot, but not be able to take off their coat and they can overheat and become sick or reach into an oven and touch hot cookies um, that are baking in the oven and burn themselves. And they, they can explain perfectly well why you wouldn't do such an action. And, and, and you mentioned um, um, in some medical contexts, and I'm very interested in addiction where negative outcomes um, fail to inform decision making. And there's many different ways threat and negative outcomes. And if you, you try to dissect the circuitry, there's seven different sub-circuits where we're getting a handle on the different cell types. And potentially, we, we know in the future, uh, we, we might be able to resensitize the circuits that are, are failing to register and, and bring that negative information into the decision to help uh, people to act differently to avoid costs. I'm Laurie, and I'm an alum of um, the Berkeley campus. I have a question specifically for the security, uh, national security person, and that is, what do you think um, emotion plays in decision making? And here I'm thinking about people uh, looking back at their own national origin or being persuaded by a particular leader who's got a lot of charisma um, and so instead of just the emotional, I mean, how much do you think the emotion plays in that kind of decision making? I mean, the short answer is you can't make decisions without emotions. This is uh, the idea that those things are separate or that you um, have a, a rational side of you and an emotional side of you has sort of been, that's been put to bed uh, with some pretty dramatic uh, neuroimaging study, well, not neuroimaging, neurological evidence um, of people who become emotionally impaired and then cannot essentially make decisions. So if you don't know how you feel about something, you're not going to be able to make a choice. That's the short answer. The long answer to your question is, you know, because you think and feel at the same time, um, if someone is trying to get you to think something or believe something, getting you to also feel something in response or in tandem has a pretty powerful effect. In fact, when you look at sort of attempts at persuasion that forego any sort of um, emotional context or content, um, you probably won't even remember those attempts. Um, <laughs> The, the, somebody giving you a list of facts, unless one of those facts happens to scare the heck out of you, 
probably isn't going to even register. And so folks who are trying to persuade or trying to instill particular beliefs, whether they know it or not, are going to integrate the um, leverage on you uh, by instilling particular emotions. And sometimes they're positive, um, trying to build a positive sense of affinity, and sometimes they're negative, trying to scare you into doing something uh, or trying to make you feel um, uh, disgust or anger or hate. Um, those are, are certainly levers that people can pull. So I would say that any decision that you make, you can walk down the supermarket and try to pick a new type of detergent and you're gonna wind up finding it very hard unless you find something to feel something about, even if it's just the price. Um, those are the trivial ways in which you need to feel something to make a choice. Once a choice or a belief becomes sort of cemented in, in you, is represented as also having a, an emotional association and a physiological response, as far as I've seen, those things are hard to shake. They're hard to alter. And so one of the, the most maybe problematic uh, features of what you've described is how sticky um, those kind of manipulated beliefs plus emotions really are. Um, I've been asked a lot how you persuade someone to not think about something as a threat. Um, and it depends on the kind of problem you think you face, but some of these are quite resistant to being moved once they've been instilled. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. Uh, hello, guys. I'm Armand. I'm a J School alumni. There, since we were talking about making better decisions, how better to discuss the election than right now? Well, it's too late to talk about making better decisions. We're three weeks out, and unless the Democrats change their candidate again, I think we're stuck with what we have right now. But my main thing is, if we look at the last eight years, the quality of candidate has gone down dramatically. And the way things are going, we're getting a lot more candidates that are, let's put it frankly, more style than substance. So how exactly can we, and this is for all four of you, how exactly can we as you know, as Americans, as electors, as voters, make the conscious decision to pick candidates who are, well, probably, well, much better qualified to lead. Vote in your primaries. <laughs> I could expand upon that, but um, so one of the debates in American politics, um, it's not something I'm super close to, but it is something that folks here do research on. In fact, there's a book talk right before this um, in the social science matrix on our polarized politics uh, that I think will probably touch on this question, um, is why do we get the candidates that we get? Well, the candidate that you see in the general election on the ballot in November is somebody who passed through a process. Um, and the processes by which you get on that ballot um, have a lot to do with who you were running against in the spring. Now, who turns out to vote for that larger slate of candidates? Well. Not everybody. Um, and who does well in those contests? Not everybody. Um, there are uh, an, there's an increasing number of folks studying that primary process for the very reason that the question raised, which is if you're concerned about the candidates who are on your ballot now, you have to look at the entire process that got them there. Um, and there's some evidence, I think, that you know that's where um, special interests can play a role because candidates need to raise money. They need to raise money when they're not necessarily well known and they're competing within their own parties, right? So it's not just enough to signal that you're sort of one type of uh, one party or another. You have to be different uh, in some way that's useful from everyone else in your party. So when you're looking at how um, extreme some candidates get and you look at why that, what we sometimes call outbidding occurs, um, it occurs earlier in the process than you'd think uh, because these are people within the same party running against each other. And the folks who are voting for them are, are, to be honest, like a little bit weird. So the people who show up to vote in primaries, I mean, maybe everyone here is a primary voter, but not everybody in the United States is a primary voter. It's a fraction of the people who vote in the general election. And so your candidates are being selected for you um, in a very real sense um, and ballots that are maybe not optimally designed um, by a, a fraction of the population. Um, so that's the kind of technical 
answer. Actually, maybe you want to answer in terms of the... Uh, of the of yeah, yeah, I just want to say part of the problem, I think, lies actually with the electoral system. So this problem about that I mentioned about vote splitting has indeed been a problem in primaries in the past, you know, where you have like a bunch of moderate candidates who split the moderate vote and then a more extreme candidate passes through the primary process. So I think that, I mean, yeah, vote in your primaries, but I think we would really help if we, some of these electoral reform efforts uh, were successful. Yeah, for example. And, and I was gonna leave uh, uh, just another angle on, on all this, um, which is uh, you could ask, you know, would who do we know of our friends who actually would put up with being a candidate uh, nowadays? And I, what I, was, I came across one rather, uh, one of the things we've been teaching in the course is, is a different angle on, um, on decision making in a society that is a little bit, uh, which is starting to be tried in actually a number of different countries uh, now, which is this technique of civic assemblies, um, deliberative polling is another uh, term that's used. Um, and so we actually enact one of these in our class to try it out. Um, uh, and, but what's, striking about it is that they take a truly random sample of the population. Um, and so for the United States, that might be you know, 600 people. Um, and so you really have all the representative uh, elements of the population in the room. And you uh, start them deliberating. And uh, so they're not a self-selected group. This is a truly random, random sampled group. Um, they, do, they go out of their way to make sure that people can come. So they pay for childcare. They pay for air t airplane tickets to fly them there. Um, they, at best, I've been, they are able to get like 95% return on some of these, which because people really you know, get the sense that they're being asked individually to come. And unlike a typical poll, which you get, what, nowadays 10% if you're lucky, um, even less, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so now you have a really representative group of people in the room. So what they say actually means something. It really tells you something about the whole group. But when they start to deliberate, of course, as you might expect, um, on some topic, they don't really know much about the topic, and so there's a little danger of you know, lack of information. So what they do is they bring in a panel of experts for them to um, ask their questions of as they get stuck in their deliberations. And the panel of experts is not allowed to lecture them, is not allowed to uh, you know, try to convince them of anything. Um, but, and they may disagree with each other. In fact, they probably will because they represent different expertise with different um, you know, positions. Um, and the deliberative group then has to adjudicate between them. So the, what, they, what they find um, is that the, that process really generates some very good behavior, that people act a little more like juries, you know, where they actually do think through problems together. They don't get stuck the way that their leaders currently would get stuck. And the reason I bring it up in response to how do we get better leaders is because I went to an event not that long ago where they had the people who were organizing this for, this, for Ireland and for Denmark and for the EU and for uh, Canada, a number of countries are starting to build this into um, the systems that work with their legislatures. Um, and they all made this comment that, um, uh, aside from anything else, when they, they talk to the people who participate in this, they come in with a group of people, as you would expect, are pretty apathetic about most of the issues of the world. They've not been really involved in, in politics. They don't read much of the news generally. Um, they say that almost always, when they come out, they are, that the group is charged up. They're really excited by the process. They all say, that was fabulous. Everybody should do that. And then a number of them end up running for office. Um, so it leaves you with that little bit of a sense of optimism that we just haven't necessarily tried every route to work well with a democratic system. And, we, and you know, along with electoral re reform, there are other games that can be played that could make a big difference. And other countries are beginning to try it. Decision making necessarily involves emotion, a little bit of optimism and hope is going to give us um, motivation to go forward. I'm so, so grateful to this amazing panel. Um, thank you so much. There's food and drink. Please stay. Please talk. I think that you'll, you'll be, they'll be able to stay. Um, there were a few hands I wasn't able to get to. Maybe you can um, ask your questions privately. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.